But there was another one. And the other one was Apocalypse Now. Apocalypse Now suffered from heart attacks, suffered from typhoons. It had gone triple budget or whatever it went. And yet, a terrific, wonderful, admirable movie emerged. And we thought, if we can somehow or other pull in the reins, be persuasive, cajole, spank, whatever we have to do, somehow we're going to pull Apocalypse Now out of Heaven's Gate. Having settled on the Apocalypse Now option, Bach and Field started to look for ways to contain costs to streamline production in Montana. The only problem was that Heaven's Gate was not suffering from heart attacks or typhoons. No acts of God were disrupting anything. The only disaster, natural or otherwise, was the director. They don't know Chimino. They only knew him when they look at, well, Thunderbolt and Lightfoot, his first project, first film, was on schedule, on budget. Deer Hunter w went over, but there were legitimate reasons. And it wins the Academy Award, and it's beautiful. But they don't know what transpired in his career prior to Thunderbolt and Lightfoot. <laughs> The office is my duty. Michael Cimino began his directing career in advertising, working on commercials for Kodak, Pepsi, and United Airlines. The clients of the agencies liked Cimino. His visuals were fabulous, but the amount of time it took was just astronomical because he was so meticulous and took so long. Nothing was easy with Michael. In a world where spending two hours lighting a prop is not only common but celebrated, Michael Cimino excelled. But making minute movies for Madison Avenue couldn't fulfill his ambitions. Cimino needed to paint on a much larger canvas. <laughs> In the early 70s, Cimino left New York for Hollywood, where he quickly co-wrote two movies, Silent Running and the Clint Eastwood vehicle, Magnum Force. Both were solid hits, and on his third film, Cimino got his first chance to direct. Have a cigar. <laughs> <laughs> where the hell did these come from? I've been saving for a celebration. Clint gave him a big break to direct this film. And Clint, is a, uh, as an actor and as a producer, doesn't like to do a lot of takes. You know, he'll do maybe three, and um, I would always go to Mike, I remember, and say, I think I can do, can I do one more? I think I got an idea. And he said, well, I'll have to ask Clint, you know. Clint would always say, give the kid a shot. I don't think about this criminals, you know. I feel we accomplished something, a good job. Clint was the only guy that ever said no. You all right, kid? You don't look too well. Michael said, okay, let's go for another take. It was take four. Clint would say, no, we got enough. I, we got it. And we move on. And, and that's the way it went. And if he took too long in getting it ready, he said, looks good, let's go. For a month, United Artists sat in Los Angeles searching for ways to speed up production on Heaven's Gate but it amounted to little more than wringing their hands. Michael Cimino, with Joanne Corelli as his producer, continued to fall behind schedule one day for each day shot. UA quickly calculated the cost to complete if Cimino was left unchecked. Their numbers were shocking. At Cimino's current pace, Heaven's Gate would finish principal photography 200 days late on a picture that was only supposed to take 69 days to film. Then there was the matter of cost, including post-production, prints, advertising, and interest. UA calculated that Heaven's Gate, whose approved budget had been $12.5 million, would cost the studio $50 million, making it the most expensive motion picture ever. Bakkenfield flew to Montana to confront 
their director. Michael always said, you always tell the studio what they want to hear. And then you just do what you're going to do. And Michael gave us very specific scenes that we were to show them, nice, long vistas, you know. Be, I mean, if you look at any individual scene in a long shot, it's amazing. I mean, the detail that went into everything. And it's all there on film. The footage was ravishing. There was nothing that anybody on Earth could say to criticize the footage. So we knew that it wasn't a case of a production that was falling apart. We never thought that it was a case of Michael was sitting in his trailer eating chocolates and watching television when he should have been out on the set. That was never the issue. The issue was we didn't agree that you could take this much time to achieve perfection. And if you continue to take this much time to achieve perfection, you're going to break our bank, and there's not going to be any company to release the picture. The folly of letting Chimino mind his own store became increasingly clear to Yue. What they needed was someone in Montana to look after their interests, to voice their concerns. And so, in a break with Yue tradition, Derek Cavanaugh, a mid-level executive with extensive production experience, was installed on the Heaven's Gate set. Yue took pains to tell Chimino that this was not a hostile move. Cavanaugh was simply there to help Joanne Corelli speed up production and keep down costs. But Michael Cimino saw it differently. I was the enemy, yes, I was the representative of those people on the other side of the fence, uh, whom Michael should have considered to be supportive and not in any way uh, um, an opponent. That night, Michael Cimino dictated a memo. He addressed it to David Field, but also posted it for all to see. It read, Derek Cavanaugh is not to come to the location site. He is not to enter the editing room. He is not to speak to me at all. It was time for option four. Fire the director. We then realized we were truly in trouble, because then you're saying, Michelangelo, put down your paintbrush. And he's saying, make me. Yes, I am insistent on certain things, uh, on certain locations, on, on, on ways of doing things, all in the interest of trying to do it in the best possible way. Uh, and in that respect, every movie director is a dictator. Uh, every movie director is a bit of a tyrant. It goes with the job. Well, you know, it's, uh, it, it's unfair to judge artists at all. But I certainly thought maybe in those days that everything could have been going a little bit faster and still get the same result. But, you know, you cannot criticize somebody who wants to do the best film in his life and wants to make it right. Vilmos told me at one point, I think Michael has fallen in love with this film. And if there was any excess, it might have been that. There was one day, as early morning, and we had started work at four in the morning with a, a dawn shot. And we shot in the morning, and the sun was there. And then the clouds came in, and we lost the light total. It was totally overcast. And Michael, we waited. And we waited, and we waited, and we waited, and we sat, and we sat, and we sat. Noon went by, and we didn't stop for lunch. And then so went three o'clock, four o'clock, five o'clock. Michael was waiting for this weather to clear, and it was like three o'clock in the afternoon, and we hadn't had lunch yet. So all these, the crew guys, everybody's on meal penalty, and it kept adding up and adding up and adding up. It was amazing. Then finally, second idiot took the courage and walked up and said, Michael, what about lunch? And then Michael Cimino, you know, just like, he was in a days of creating, you know, he said, lunch? This is bigger than lunch. Heaven's <laughs> Gate was bigger than lunch.
Most directors are there to, to put their ideas onto film. They're not interested in how much does this cost or, you know, what we know. You have to break now for lunch. Why? I don't have to break now for lunch. I can see the sun coming over the hill. You know, there's that beautiful cloud. That's, that will be there for all eternity if I get it on film. Nobody cares about the lunch hour 20 years from now, but they'll be able to see that, that visual that I've created forever. And that's what it's about. Unless you're paying the bills, but Michael wasn't paying the bills. <laughs>